All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call this special meeting of the Board of Education at order. If we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. We have one item on our agenda tonight. This is actually a public hearing specific to the special education audit. Um, just remind people under our policy 9325, uh, you get three minutes for comments. We, of course, ask that you be respectful. I think most of you have heard these before, so I probably won't uh, spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but this specifically per the notice of the meeting is about the special education audit. We would ask that you please focus on the audit itself or future planning for the audit. That's really what we want to hear from you tonight. That'll be helpful, most helpful to us as we move forward in terms of implementation, which I think is the most exciting part for most of us and why you're all here. And I appreciate the, uh, the turnout. We've got 12 speakers signed up this evening. Um, we had 13. One was unable to make it. So I will go in the order of uh, sign up. And the first speaker is Katie Yu. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm just gonna kind of jump right into it in the interest of time. Um, so in reading this exhaustive and comprehensive report, the two words that came most to mind were opportunity and urgency. Overall, parents may feel both gratified and disappointed to see that parents have been right as the report details inconsistencies across buildings, instances where PPS is not keeping up with the law changes even in spirit, and unfortunately, a sense of PPS acting in a combative nature with parents. Um, <clears throat> uh, please note that my comments do not reflect the entire 2E community as this report was delivered at a time when some families were not able to read this in detail. In general, I applaud the addition of recommendations number nine and 10, which call for increased access to students with disabilities into advanced and accelerated courses, as well as identification and support for 2E learners within these classes. The report details that in parent focus groups, parents indicated that 2E children don't have equal access to advanced classes and accommodations that might be necessary to succeed in advanced learning programs may, um, and advanced courses may not be offered. Recommendation number eight refers to reconstructing instructional models. Many of the sections, including this one, refer only to grade level content, but how does this support 2E learners? Um, identification of gifted students with disabilities also seems somewhat murky. While the ALP department has made progress towards this, certain roadblocks still exist in the areas of identification and necessary reports within advanced classes. On page 48, the report shows that of students referred for SPED, uh, SPED evaluation, 4% four were, were identified as gifted and 96% were not. And in the calendar year 2920, no students were. On page 78, PCG notes that only some 42% of SPED teachers and 46% of gen ed teachers agree that students with disabilities who show an academic aptitude for advanced classes are being recommended for or given access to advanced courses. Furthermore, PCG noted only 31% of SPED teachers and 21% of gen ed teachers agree that service for both students with disabilities also enrolled in ALP are meeting their needs. This is indicative of a notable percentage of students with disabilities that are being excluded from these accelerated and advanced programs. <clears throat> Notably, page 32, summary and implications does not mention any concern about the possible lack of identification of gifted students with IEPs. This figure also seems to run counter to the growing number of families within, with students in the PTAC 2E group. GPS must align all curricular programs and supports with UDL principles with assistive, 30 seconds. Yikes, with assistive technology as an integral component of its implementation starting this next school year. I'm just gonna skip through and send my notes further. Um, as next steps, what I would suggest is um, 
<clears throat> sorry, while the report does a great job identifying issues, the report does not seem to address or lay out suggestions for a clear path for those who want or feel they need evaluations and help to get them. On page 41, teachers express their frustration that the system is broken. The report is also filled with commentary from parents who echo the concerns of other parents who speak regularly at BOED meetings. Where do we go from here? Me moving forward, I would recommend an interim update in three years with full updates scheduled six in 10 years to see how we have progressed with these findings and recommendations and moving in a more focused direction. I'll send my comments as well since there's a lot that I didn't get. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Laura Costin. If you give us one second, we're working on the timer. Dear board members and Dr. Jones, thank you so much for holding this meeting and allowing members of the special education community the chance to speak. The report provided by PCG is validating for many families, including mine. I have two children with learning differences. There are certain portions of this report that seem to leap out from the page, including this one from page 17, as evidenced by the multiple program reviews that have occurred in special education and in other programmatic areas, GPS is accustomed to analysis and reflection. Resulting action and changes in practice, however, have been slow to come. The PPT process, communications and engagement, the continuum of services and professional development have been identified as areas of concern in an external, in external, um, all external uh, special education reports dating back to 1997. Aside from pointing out the obvious that change in this area has until now been elusive, this report is excruciatingly clear in its findings. To date, the Greenwich Public Schools isn't properly evaluating, identifying, or providing mandated services to students who are in need of them. And GPS employees have said explicitly that staffing levels are not advocate. So uh, adequate. So as you as a board begin to prioritize goals and look toward execution, I'm incredibly grateful that we have a committed superintendent and I'm also relieved and optimistic that you as a board have voted to retain PCG to help with the implementation of these many recommendations. Lastly, from January to June of 2019, three new preschool sections were added as the number of new preschool age children requiring special education services increased. In the 2020-2021 budget, a new ratio was applied by the Greenwich Public Schools to slow the growth rate of new preschool classroom sections. The ratio of typical peers to children with IEPs was changed from 10 to five to nine to six. And while this did result in a needed savings, I humbly ask that we return to the previous ratio of 10 to five, ensuring that our youngest and most vulnerable students across the district are able to receive services from a staff that isn't spread any thinner than it needs to be. And hopefully this is another area where our federal funds can be used. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Marla Beer. And she may be online. Marla, Marla Beer, if you're with us online, if you could raise your hand. Can give it a shot. Um, otherwise, uh, they can obviously send us emails with their comments, which would be helpful as well. All right, the next speaker is Jennifer Kutai. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay. I would like to begin by reading a quote from a teacher interview on page 49 of the PCG report. Quote, I have three special education students in my class, and two of them are not seen by the special ed teacher because he is needed elsewhere. IEPs are not being followed, and parents have no idea. Our assistant principal tries to work around IEP accommodations by putting special ed students together in the same class so she can say they are being serviced together, even if they are not. 
I don't believe our assistant principal does a good job explaining to parents the IEPs and the evaluation process. She assumes they are aware of all of the process and rushes through things that need to be delicately handled with these families. As a parent, as a founder of the SEAC, and as a community member, I would like to hear from PCG and the Board of Ed, what are your immediate plans to remediate federally mandated services in students' IEPs that are currently not being given? This cannot wait three months, let alone three years, as it is your legal obligation. At Eastern Middle School, you have an assistant principal that took it upon herself during COVID-19 to reduce a significant amount of student service hours without prior written notice. Ms. Katai, if you have specific interests in, in specific individuals, I ask that you address those with the superintendent offline. This is about the audit report. Thank you. Yes, I, I, am, I am addressing it as, as the audit report, actually. Uh, Peter, if you could stop the clock for a minute. Um, this actually- The, the clock is running, please continue. As unconscionable as it is that, you've, that you don't follow the law, let's just start there. It is far worse that our district has a bevy of administrators who for many years have indignantly bro break in, been breaking the law. When they are called out by parents, the response from the administrators is, quote, this is how we do it in Greenwich. The fact that so many people partook in these behaviors does not make it any less illegal. I ask you this, what is your plan to eliminate rogue administrators? How many more SPED students will you set up for abject academic failure? If GPS continues to fail to implement services as outlined in IEPs, the gaps between where these children are academically and where they need to be will continue to widen. If you truly want the culture to change, draconian systemic changes must 30 be 30 seconds. Merely retiring the chief PPS officer or changing the sign on her door is tantamount to moving the chairs around on the Titanic. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Alon Kutai. Hello. The fight that we have had to wage to ensure that our daughter receives an education has been beyond belief. Why is it that parents are vilified when they speak up about their child not getting the same opportunity at an education as their general education peers? Why has there always been ample money for ALP teachers, yet never enough for SPED teachers? The answer is simple, it's better optics. Why is it that the district exacts retaliation consistently on both SPED parents and the students when called out? At Eastern Middle School, my daughter didn't even have a single classroom that was not all SPED children. They simply don't believe in practicing the least restrictive environment, which again is federal law. It's rather a simple task, but there's a cavalier attitude amongst administrators who do not feel obligated to afford special ed children the same opportunities as their peers. Have you considered the emotional impact of segregation on teenagers? Administrators at Eastern Middle know that they are violating the law and they simply don't care. As evidenced by their setup for next year, three tiers of teaching, six, six A and out, all special ed are on six level, even after the PCG review. This is the same path that EMS has been on for the last two decades. On page 48 of the PCG report, you point to a legal case that was won on the Supreme Court level. It says, quote, IEP goals may differ. However, every student should have the opportunity to meet challenging objectives. The Supreme Court made it crystal clear that IDAA demands more, end quote. And such as parents stand here before you tonight and say, we demand more for our children. We demand equal rights for our special education children. We expect that you will follow the law. That doesn't take three years. I've spent the better part of my last three decades on Wall Street. If I had altered a client's financials, I, I not only would have been fired, I would have been prosecuted and jailed, and rightfully so. Why are you not holding these administrators who break the law every single day to those same standards? There could be no more important job than the School of Administrator. 
You are responsible for these children's futures. What I hope you remember tonight is the harm that some of the administrators have, have inflicted on innocent children without a care in the world because protecting their position was more important, your positions was more important than educating the children. You need to clean up your act. Do what Darien Public School System did after the class action lawsuit. Hire professionals, qualified teams of professionals to rebuild special education from top to bottom. Desperately needed a do-over in Greenwich. What Fine. lies in the balance? Thank you very much. Your children's lives. Thank you very much. You can submit the rest of your comments via email to the board if you'd like. The next speaker is Caroline Learham. Good evening, Board of Education members, Dr. Jones, and the Greenwich community. My name is Caroline Larum, and I want to begin by touching on the culture of special education in the Greenwich Public Schools. To do this, I'll share a brief experience. The first time I walked into the previous PPS director's office, I saw a sign with a cactus on it, and it stated, quote, not a hugger, end quote. On the one hand, this could be seen as funny. On the other hand, however, what message does this send to families, staff, or anyone who walked into that director's office. To the new PPS director, I hope more than anything that you embrace our children, embrace the special education community, embrace change, and embrace a new mindset. A mindset that puts children's needs before anything else, before the politics, before the budget, and before anyone's pride. There must be a culture of change from the top down. This will be essential in implementing any of the recommendations made by PCG with fidelity. On the bottom of page six of the executive summary, it states that there is, quote, a belief by some administrators that the present structure should not change. A fixed mindset is fostered by instruction that is inclusive in name only, where building administrators are not supportive of co-teaching, and a belief by building administrators that the present structure should not change, end quote. If building administrators have this mindset, how will the 28 recommendations be implemented successfully? Therefore, it's essential that there will be an openness to change, a humbleness instilled, and a desire for growth. It is noted that GPS's special education program continues to operate much like one may have in 1997. It's been operating like this for the past two decades. Therefore, it is vital that staff receive mandatory professional development so they, so they can seconds. acquire updated skills to educate our children appropriately. With lagging or outdated skills, it's not possible for any of the recommendations to serve our children as intended. Lastly, we must come together. In the words of Helen Keller, alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Jenny Reynolds. All right, are you seeing Jen, Jenny Reynolds online? Jenny, if you're online, if you could raise your hand so we could recognize you. Jenny, you should be good to go. Thank you. Good evening. We moved here three years ago with intent to send both our girls, one with Down syndrome, to public school. We chose Greenwich because of the district's claimed inclusive approach. PCG states our special education program operates like it's 1997, when inclusion was still ambiguous. We've had some well-intentioned and hardworking team members, but do agree that the district's programming is archaic. 
Poorly executed inclusion or inclusion in name only places kids with IEPs in general education without the curriculum structure and support they need. A chair in the room is not inclusion. A paraprofessional glued to a kid's side is not inclusion. And while pullouts for certain skills are appropriate, pulling a kid out of the classroom multiple times per day is not inclusion, it's disruptive. True inclusion requires general and special educators to co-own all kids, collaborate on lesson plans, even co-teach them, and plan multiple ways for curriculum to be accessed and individualized. It requires a district-wide culture that embraces diversity and fosters social responsibility and positive peer relationships. It means looking beyond traditional ways we value community members and finding ways for kids of all abilities to succeed within the same classroom. It's their civil right and is backed by an overwhelming number of studies as best practice for all students. Without this mindset, kids struggle because they can't access the curriculum and an inability to access what peers are doing results in frustration and quote unquote behaviors, not because the kids can't handle the classroom or the work, but because they aren't given the opportunity to access it. These are cries for help labeled as behaviors, resulting in further pullouts, more segregation, greater achievement gaps, and much heartache. In our daughter's case, at the age of eight, these frustrations that solely existed in school led her to being restrained on the floor of her classroom by three adults for 12 minutes. I implore you tonight to act decisively for the sake of all kids. You have had numerous studies telling you GPS is decades behind. The time to act is now. The time to fund is now. The action plan should immediately benefit current students. Mandatory widespread training is a good start. This training could be comprehensive and cohesive, including all departments and must be integrated into practice. Also, please note the equity of staffing ratios. Some schools have six students per special educator while others have 17. Finally, we ask for seconds. transparency and accountability as you move forward. Please make your timeline for implementation visible. Continue to use outside consultants, not just for action planning, but for implementation. We need you to champion this and to ensure the budget is there and the changes happen this time. So many lives depend on this. Greenwich should be proud of the high ratings and the strong advanced studies and sports programs. And now it's time to be proud of the special education programming as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Molly Salibi. Good evening. Everybody on the board knows me and are my friends and acquaintances. Um, and I'm rising tonight just to speak as an advocate on behalf of students overall. Uh, everyone also knows how much I support Greenwich Public Schools and have stood up at plenty of podium in support of the of the district and the programs in the capital, et cetera. Uh, everyone also knows I'm, I'm a product of, of uh, the public schools here in town. I did the math today and uh, the Salibis have had 15 students in the public schools for 45 years, um, 1966 to 1989. And again, from 2001 to 2023 will be our last. And uh, you know, we only had uh, one of my nieces and nephews just needed a little extra reading support and extra time to take tests in elementary school. That was the extent of what I really knew about special ed here in town until I got involved um, with the RTM four years ago and started to hear stories. Um, and I said, it just can't be true. Uh, how do we have a special ed program in the town of Greenwich that's broken and doesn't match our program overall? Um, and uh, so, when I was here a few weeks ago, and I guess it was June 23rd maybe, and I heard um, you all state that there really weren't any surprises in the report, and that also it would may take a longer time to implement some things. I kind of view that as both good and bad. Um, the good and bad that there weren't any surprises, but the bad part being um, if we know what we need to work on, why hasn't it already been taken care of? Um, I'm really delighted that you didn't have to go through the arduous process of asking the BET and the RTM for money to fund the implementation. Um, and uh, Please, whatever it takes, money, resources, a culture shift, staff shakeup across the district, 
There are no do-overs with children. Um, I also, you know, I spent the last year, as some of you know, teaching four first grade girls in a pod from Glenville School in remote learning. It was one of the most rewarding um, professional uh, experiences that I had. Why? Because I recognized how much every child wants to learn. The capacity for children to learn is so great, whether they have deficiencies or not. I'm also close to a family whose child is two and a half now and uh i've known her since she was six months old and she'll be entering the, the system in january and i want her to have a smooth transition and a positive experience like all children please please i beg of you whatever you need to be done it's got to be done thank you thank you very much the next speaker is christine dodash christine if you're online if you could raise your hand all right we've got to go ahead christine Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Good evening, Dr. Jones, Board of Education members and special education parents. My name is Christine Dodage and I am here before you tonight as a parent of not one, but two special education students within the Greenwich Public Schools. I would like to highlight the following comments made by special education teachers within the district on the PCG survey and I quote, unidentified students take too long to be addressed properly. The steps make little sense sometimes when it's clear a student needs help, but we go through too many tiers to get there. And our procedure for identifying kids is dysfunctional. Only the parents, children of whose parents are extremely vocal get identified early. The children whose parents can't or don't advocate languish in the intervention system, which is worse than the identification process. I know this is true from our own experience. And the process is broken. It takes far too long for a student to go through the evaluation process. There are so many roadblocks and the often the word of the teachers in the building are, there's not, uh, are not enough for central office. I refer to these comments as we have just finally obtained a much needed answers for my own child after the initial ask evaluation for evaluation eight years ago. Instead of giving the actual evaluations after she was identified by the Clark House who has been absolutely amazing and the first group of administrators in my daughter's entire education that have seen her decline and actually rose to the occasion for her. Dr. Jones, on behalf of all special ed parents, we ask for full transparency as you move forward. We beg you, do not stop draining the swamp. Only two years ago, I stood before you and everyone there and pleaded that you must rid our students of administrators that don't comply and have done GPS and our students and dedicated special ed staff so wrong and intentionally so. How many more students were delayed and side railed with ridiculous statements from the assistant principal? Clearly, these administrators who failed failed our children, and seems only their only agenda was seconds. not to attack the system and not identifying and serving special ed students. We as parents are here to support you because we know you are definitely going to need it. Please clean house so we can start to have real systemic change for, and I'll quote my own self are so very broken system. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Audra Donovan. Audra. Good evening, Dr. Jones, the Board of Education and the families here today. We are gathered here tonight to understand what next steps and an action plan you will take. It is abundantly clear that our district is in serious jeopardy. As evidenced by the PCG statement, GPS special education program continues to operate much like one may have in 1997. What PCG and the Board of Education must, must keep in front and center are the children that have suffered not only academic setbacks, but significant irreparable harm at the hands of GPS administrators. Several who reported to PCG that the present structure did not need to change. 
I would like to read a statement from a parent who wished to come here tonight and speak, but she's too afraid to speak. Quoting her, like so many other parents in our district have experienced, the school disputed my psychologist's report by making a retaliatory referral against me to DCF. After the investigation closed, I met with the GPS administrator to discuss the district's practice of referring families to DCF. To my shock, she admitted to me that the district does not allow teachers to use their judgment in determining whether there is a good faith basis to make such a referral. So to be clear, our administrators are knowingly making bad faith referrals to DCF on our families. GPS did not come to this position by one person and removing one person is not going to fix it. We must end the belief that so many parents often hear, this is how we do it in Greenwich. The shift in administering, administering special education services needs to be dramatic. The report does not imply minor tweaking that comes with just a change in leadership. The systemic culture of our special education department must change today. If any employee does not believe that every child is capable of success, then you must make it clear that Greenwich is not a good fit for them. There has, there has to be accountability. A parent called me a few weeks ago and said she waited nine months for an evaluation. We have students entering high school on a fourth grade reading level that they have received special education services in our district for eight years. We have parents who still have not been notified of their summer school schedule or the busing and summer school started today. Teachers have continuously reported they are, they are directed not to put the children's needs as the priority as staffing must be considered. 30 seconds. Why? Oh, okay, administrators should find solutions, not reasons to obstruct and instead work as partners with parents. Be transparent, keep the child front and center. There must be a change in our culture that requires more changes in personnel. The special education department needs an appropriate allocation of resources, mandated professional training and clear non-negotiable accountability measures. Your next step is crucial. Let's think outside the box. Let's look at the specialized schools around us and Time. see what works. We have a tremendous Thank opportunity available. Thank Let's you, Audra. seize this opportunity. The next speaker is Alyssa Williams. Alyssa, if you're online, if you could raise your hand. All right, I think you can go ahead. Okay. My name is Alyssa Williams and I am a single mom with two special needs daughters. I am here tonight scared and afraid of the retaliation many other special education parents have faced, but I feel I must do what is better for my two daughters that I love more than anything else in this world. Rain is in sixth grade and has suffered serious educational setbacks, not because she is learning disabled, but rather because of the serious neglect at the hands of the administrators, both at the elementary and middle school levels. I have been excluded from a triennial meeting, which is a serious violation of the Individuals with Disabilities Act. They failed to provide me with a copy of her IEP in a timely manner, which violates Connecticut state laws. I told my daughter's sixth grade team, however concerned I was about her regressions and how her goals reflected that of a third grader. Her math goals included counting points that is not the goal of a sixth grader. The question is why would Greenwich public school, schools look to do everything possible not to offer my daughters the services she so desperately needs? At a meeting for my younger daughter, I was told by the assistant principal at Julian Curtis that they were going to stop the clock on my request for a full evaluation because quote, she had 2040 vision in one eye. I took her to the ophthalmologist and sure enough, she has 2020 vision, yet another delay tactics. Again, this is a direct violation of the IDEA. The reading specialist backdated a letter and tried to slip it into my daughter's backpack, despite the fact that I have requested all correspondence be via email. Why scare tactics are to send it, an assistant principal to public housing at night, uninvited to see how she can call DCF on parents, children with disabilities. Again, the question is why would Greenwich Public Schools look to intentionally cause harm to my innocent child. The pure evil and disturbing behaviors of administrations through this district will impact the futures of thousands of children. Enough is enough. You didn't 
need this PCG review to drain your swamp. I have lots to lose speaking tonight, but I will never give up on my daughters and a public school like Gretna should never give up on their children. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Marla Beer, hopefully we resolve the sound issue. If you could raise your hand. Aaron, I think we've got you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, Dr. Jones, Board of Ed members and parents. I'm addressing you this evening regarding the recent findings from the PCG report. Dr. Jones, thank you for leading the charge on this issue. PCG has confirmed what many parents right, and great. dedicated staff I mean, already, already knew. However, our reality is quite grim. The dismissal of the district's PPS administrator after a protracted period of egregious and vicious actions was long overdue, but is not the only answer to our district's special ed issues. The damage that has been done runs long and deep and has affected countless innocent students and families. I will share with you solely my own experiences so as not to speculate, but to be in fact very clear. There are GPS principles in place for many years who continue to this day to deny RTIs. There are principals in place who alter students' IEPs without prior written notice, without a PPT, without a parent's consent or knowledge. The head of the teachers union shared this exact information at a board meeting this past September, and yet sadly nothing changed. We have skill, unskilled staff writing IEPs that do not accurately reflect the students' needs. This is a daily occurrence. My own child had goals written on their IEP for which they didn't receive services. To make matters worse, my child was expected to report in on their progress instead of the GPS staff educating my child. And we had no idea until we hired an advocate. For those who don't know, an IEP, IEP is a legal document. It's designed to protect the student's rights. So the concern is why doesn't Greenwich have skilled and trained professionals writing IEPs in an IEP department? Sadly, most parents don't know how to read an IEP and therefore do not clearly understand the ramifications as such. Parents, my greatest piece of advice is do not ever, ever enter a PPT without an advocate, ever. Spend the thousand dollars, it's well worth it. If you can't afford it, hire an, if you can't afford an advocate, contact SELF, the Special Ed Legal Fund, and they will help you. What GPS needs is 100% transparency. And we are here tonight to tell you that enough is enough. As in any great relationship where there is no transparency, there is nothing. And as parents, we deserve to have full and unhampered access to every single state mandated test that is administered to our children. Not a piece of paper with some numbers and percentiles, but in fact, tangible information that we can view so we know which areas our children are lacking in. Dr. Jones, we are behind you. We know you can do it. Please, if you have staff that's violating state and federal law, they must be put out to pasture. If parents complain, you must be, dive deeply into what's happening. The tone must start at the top. To our superintendent, we know you can do it. It's time to part company with your staff that doesn't behold these ideals. PCG's um, findings are, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that's the end of our uh, public comments for tonight. No, sorry, we can't take additional comments. We do sign ups online so we can, yeah, so we can make sure that uh, people at home get the opportunity. Um, before we- uh, I am so sorry, I signed up online to speak. What was your name? Eileen Tweddle. I'm sorry, you must have done that past the deadline and you're not listed. If you want, you can submit comments in writing to the board via email. We pull the reports at noon. Um, just so everybody knows, before we adjourn, we are working on scheduling the action planning meeting. It's July, vacations were tough. We have our new uh, interim PPS director who just joined us. So we are looking to do that in the very near future. So watch for an announcement from the district when we, uh, when we get that meeting scheduled. All right, with that, Mr. Kelly, do you have a motion for us? Make sure you don't get too wet outside. It's raining. Be careful. <laughs> and I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All right. I'm going to second that motion. We'll take a quick roll call. Bernstein's a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Francis? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Kowalski and Cher are absent. So that's. No, I'm here. Oh, I'm Peter's here. on. Oh, great. Peter, motion to adjourn? Yes. All right. So that passes 7 0. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.